Good afternoon, everyone. Th thank you, John. I'm afraid I've got an apology to make. This is full of acronyms. Our world in any of energy revolves around acronyms. So, so bear with me. I'll try and liven it up a bit if I can. So, just a quick run through what this is all about. So, so what are grid su support services? Why do we need them? And then move into all the acronyms that I've got. To be fair, triads are not a grid support service, but they are a fundamental part of battery economics and lots of other lovely things that I will flesh out for you. So, National Grid. Why, why do we want all these services? Well, National Grid, their job, amongst many other things, is to keep the grid in balance. And by that, we mean they need to, near as damn it, match generation to demand every second of the day. They don't have the equivalent of water towers that have mass electricity storage potential. Even with what John's talking about, if we have two gigawatts of battery installed in the next few years, you go, wow, that's a lot. They're generally matched with two gigawatt hours of actual true energy storage capacity. As a country, we hit a peak of about 50 to 55 gigawatts at tea time in winter. So that two gigawatts doesn't go far. So it's not about bulk energy storage at the moment. That's not where we're at with batteries. It's about tuning and balancing the grid. And it's just another tool, potentially, that National Grid can use to, to deliver that. And if you're, a little, if, if you're a little bit geeky, as arguably I am, there's nice things on YouTube that show you actually what happens in the National Grid Co Control Centre that, by coincidence, is about a mile away as a crow flies from my home. And they do have people there staring at lots of screens with flashing lights and colours on and numbers reacting to them you know, every second of the day. And their job's getting more difficult with more wind and solar, particularly buried within the local networks they have no visibility of. The networks, but it's becoming even less predictable. They are trying to model things like you would not believe. Now, the idea that Coronation Street finishes and everybody puts the kettle on is a piece of cake compared to what they're seeing and, and, and having to handle now. And so they're going to need more of it, and they're going to need more tools in their toolkit, as it were. And this comes from what was SNAPS, their system needs and what's it consultation. I forget the full title now. But hopefully it shows through. It's the certain need. They're saying we certainly need all of this balancing capacity. And you might just make out the pale blue lines, but it's going up, 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 up in coming years. So basically saying, we think we're going to need more and more balancing capacity. And so you go, we'll go, well, hey, increasing demand. That's good. Price will go up. Not necessarily. But we can see where, you know, where the trends are, are taking is in terms of needs. So I'll, I'll move into each of these acronyms, if you like, and explain how each one operates on its own. And then I'll move into a couple of things, sort of a battery and a diesel gen scenario to say, right, well, actually, how do these all stack together? How do they add up? What does the investment case look like in a, in a, in a very simple sense? Now, I'll look around the audience here. I know there's one or two of you who have already got CHPs, and you'll, be, and you'll know a lot about triads, but uh, many of you don't either, and it's nothing to do with um, some kind of old-school oriental crime gang or, or anything like that. So, how it works is this. You, 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 as a user of electricity, on your bill, you would probably have something called a capacity charge or an ASC, so much per kVA each month. That's a fee that you pay for the cables to your property to be big enough to give you the maximum amount of power that you might only want once a year. And in that set, in similar to that, the network operators, your Northern Power Grid, your WPD, or, or whoever, have to pay a capacity charge to National Grid. Now, that is set according to how much that network is taking from National Grid when the UK hits the max. And the max is, in effect, your triads. And they are defined as the three highest half hours of consumption in the UK as a whole. They've got to be a minimum of 10 days apart, so if we have two really cold nights, only one of them counts. And the period we look at is November to February inclusive. 
So in effect, those three comets there, collectively, that's what we think of as the triads. And we get terribly excited about triads. I'm looking at some chaps sat there at the back. So it, it could be caused, you know, to give you a feeling for it, if you've got a two megawatt CHP, a tri if you are exporting during all three of them, it's probably worth 100 grand per winter. And so we get alerts from energy suppliers who say, hey, we think there might be one tonight, and we all get a little excited and send text messages out, and people run out and make sure their engines are running, and, and so on and so on, because it's worth a good chunk of cash. And that's not just for generators, for exporters. Actually, triad costs are levied on users of electricity. It's just you don't generally see that in the main on your average electricity contract. But you do have some bigger users of electricity will turn stuff off when there's a triad warning to avoid paying the cost. Um, oh, got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, but yes, ultimately the triad costs or the capacity charge that the networks pay to National Grid is passed on to you, even me in my house, although I'll never see it on my bill as, 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 as part of the bill that we receive. So, yep, there we go. Got excited and carried away on triads yet again. I thought, you'd think I'd get over it. We've been doing it for a few <laughs> years. But, uh, yeah. Right, what are triads worth? The graph here, they vary according to region. Um, so what, what we've got on the blue line, it's, uh, that, that's, that's this winter. And looking forward a few years, this is what National Grid are forecasting. So they have been increasing by quite some margin, even be before the significant increases in recent years to get to this point. Anybody from Northern Scotland? No? I won't. There's a bit of a special thing went on in Northern Scotland, um, so we won't bother, bother labouring that point. But you can see the costs are going up and up and up. Or if you like, the value or the potential value or the potential saving is going up and up. There is a little nasty surprise in the wings that some of you will know about. We'll get, we'll get to that in, in, in a little while. Put it into perspective, a kettle is about two kilowatts. Now, accepting that when you make a cup of tea, the kettle isn't on solidly for a whole half hour, but if it was, that kettle would contribute to 140 pounds worth of triad cost. So you kind of go, wow, well, you think, yeah, that's, that's a lot of money for a kettle. Or just in terms of it, you just think what you may or may not be able to run or avoid running during a potential triad and what that might be worth to you. Now, the difficulty with triads is that we only know when the triads were come the end of February because it's what the three highest were. There could always be another one tomorrow. There could always be a higher one tomorrow. So what we end up doing is we have, when you get your triad alerts, you might have 20 or 30 little text messages from someone like us or your energy supplier saying, look out, there might be one tonight. So you actually have to react quite a number of times to make sure you either hit or avoid your triad. But you know, it, it, it does offer some, po some possibilities. But as a kind of a round number, Probably, you know, for every megawatt of capacity, whether that's your battery, your CHP, or, 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 or turning stuff off, if you're unfortunate enough to have a megawatt of electricity load that you can turn on and off at will, then it can be worth about 45, 50,000 pound a year. So, yeah, useful bit of cash. Right, we'll move on to store, short-term operating reserve. National Grid always come up with lots of snappy titles. How does this work? It is on-demand generation. So, so National Grid will pay you to sit there waiting for them to go, go! We're stressed. We need some help. It's a bit twisted in a way. If you've got a generator or a battery for that matter to, to, be, to earn store income, you have to make a difference. When they, when they say go, you have to be able to make a difference. So. If you've got your CHP or your battery, it's got to sit there doing nothing most of the time until they say, go. So, and, and how does that work? Well, oh yes, forgot about that one. Another key factor in this is that you have to be at full power. If I've got a contract for one megawatt with National Grid, I have to be, deliver that one megawatt within about 10 minutes. You can say what your speed of delivery is, but the slower you are, the less likely you are to get some action. But generally, around about 10 minutes is what we see for gas engines. 
obviously batteries can be a lot faster than that and that moves them into a whole other league that, that we'll move on to in, in a little while. When it boils down to it, if you have a store contract, you will generally be paid an availability payment to sit there and do nothing, which interestingly is less than the minimum wage at the moment. And you get paid good money, the utilization payment, when they actually ask you to run. And you get the electricity to sell. Again, round numbers. Oh, forgot this piece. Store is not a 24-hour day service. It's, kind of, it's, it's quite, quite a fundamental concept to, to get your head around. In the, in the land of store, we talk about seasons and windows. Um, windows are typically sort of weekday, weekend differences. Window one, window two. The different seasons simply affect those times by a relatively small degree. So typically, what National Grid are saying is, between these two, two pet groups of hours, that's when things might go wrong for us. That's when we want you available. So, so between half past one and half past four, you can do what you like with your battery, your generator, your whatever else. You're free to do whatever you want. And there's an interesting sort of game to play in terms of matching incomes. And is it, is it, is it better to go in store and not generate and day on day on day? And there's all sorts of questions and, and economics around that. But again, round numbers, store could be worth £25,000 a year per megawatt, something of that order. But it's not, that's not really a battery thing because it's not, that's not where the money's at. There's, there's still more money to come for batteries in, in, in particular. Store can also apply to you turning a load off. We have looked at and, and, and do have a couple of sites that turn lights off well, on a store call, so you're still having an impact on the grid. The key point, though, is that you have to know that you're definitely on to contract that capacity. And so, okay, if, 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 if you know, as growers, you might have lights on all through the night, oh, well, that's not going to hit one of those windows, is it? And if the sun's shining by 11 o'clock in the morning, I want to turn them off. I don't want to have to leave them on till half past one so that I might just get asked to turn them off to earn 60 quid. So generally, you know, store for lighting seems like there's an opportunity, but the reality of it is in terms of the hours of availability you might be able to give to National Grid, you might say, well, okay, stretching it a bit October through to March, you might be able to give them 7 a.m. till 11 a.m. And then you've got to think about the cropping impact. If you've got your plants all revved up and then you turn the lights off, our, our, our unpleasant things things going to happen so generally store for lighting isn't isn't practically and financially worthwhile right capacity market the next one this is this is a newish kind of scheme is capacity market it was a another what you might call keep the lights on strategy well i suppose announced by government implemented by ofgem as a means of encouraging new generation plant to be built by giving it as kind of a secure background level, level of income. And it has a very similar feel to it for store, actually, um, where you are paid to be there on call to National Grid. The key difference is that if you're already running, you're still a good guy. You don't have to sit there and do nothing until they say run. They just want to be sure that when push comes to shove that you are running and contributing to the country's demand. And so you actually get paid a fixed amount per month, no matter how much they ask you to run or not. It's just as long as once in a blue moon when they do have a real stress on and they say you'd better be running, as long as you are, you still get your money. Or rather, you keep your money. Um, what they do is they, actually, they can actually claw back money paid. Fortunately, the maximum they can claw back is just what they've, give, the to is, is what they've given you in a year. So your worst place is zero. And you'd have to be pretty shocking to, 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 get, to get that point. There is an annual auction for the capacity market. It's normally in December, actually, for some various reasons. It's in January this time around. If you are an existing generator or an existing battery, you can only pitch in for a one-year contract every year. Annually, you'll be going for a one-year contract, typically a contract for four years ahead. 
You can do one year ahead contract as well, which is quite a long term gain. If you are deemed to have been refurbished as a generator under a spend thresholds on, on this, you can, you can actually go for a three year contract. What the battery guys like and the funders behind them is that if you are seen as a new build, which you know, there aren't many second hand batteries kicking around, um, you can actually go for a 15 year contract. You can bid into the auction for a 15 year contract. So that is very solid underpinning income that your financiers like. So that, that's, and, and that was really very much a, a, a reason for the capacity market and the structure of it. The idea was that the, your eons and what have you of this world will build some big gas-fired power stations because the 15-year contract at a rate of X helped them get over their investment hurdles. As it happens so far, the capacity market rates have been way lower than anybody expected, and hardly any gas-fired power stations have been built off the back of it, and there's all sorts of things being redesigned in the background to try and um, manipulate the auction by a allegedly legal and non-manipulative way, um, which we will touch on as we go on. At the moment, the capacity market, we're hoping, expecting, that the capacity market prices this January will be higher than they have been previously. Um, previously, they've been around about the £20 a, a kilowatt or £20,000 a megawatt mark. By the, pe by the time a few people have had a, a slice of the action, if we end up with about £20,000 a, a megawatt in our pockets, that's, I'm hoping that's a pessimistic view. Uh, we will see. Right, moving into some of the more fancy stuff. Honest. Firm frequency response. National Grid do actually publish this on a website. You can look on, on, on a website and they, they are showing us what the frequency on the network is in the, last, in the preceding hour. And it wibbles around and look at, the, look at the scale though, it's a very tight scale. They have to keep the frequency within some very tight limits. And so this is where they've got to have fast reaction stuff. When something happens once in a blue moon that really throws a network off on one that never saw it coming, they need some grunt, let's say, to come on pretty fast and, 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 and dig them out of the mess. And firm frequency response is a part of that but actually only kicks in once the frequency falls outside certain limits. So if the frequency goes too high, so bearing in mind we want 50, bang on, if it goes above 50.3, they're saying, they're ringing up the, the big generator saying, turn down guys, or, or, or they're looking at actually calling load to come on. So yes, if you have megawatts of lighting doing nothing, you could actually turn your lights on to satisfy this service. Again. Don't know anybody that's doing it. It's a little bit of a, you know, again, you know, chances are your high, your high frequency events tend to be in the summertime. Are you going to turn your lights on when nobody else is wanting electricity because it's probably a scorching hot day anyway and then you're just going to batter your plants even more than you've been battered by the sun itself, perhaps. It's the bottom end of things that is perhaps of more relevance, particularly obviously to your generators. Um, and so yes, if the frequency drops under 49.7, there's a call to run. The challenge here is that if you've got, if whatever your contracted capacity is, you have to be able to deliver that within 30 seconds. Um, talking to some diesel engine guys, that's doable. You have to, uh, with kind of a smile on their face, it's a bit like we'll take that chip out of the engine management system and we'll put this one in. <laughs> and it will you know, shorten the life of the engine quite dramatically. But, we're only generally being asked to run for 30 minutes max, 30 times a year. I could, you know, if you've got a brand new diesel engine and you, and you reduce its lifetime by a factor of 10, if we're only running 15 hours a year, it's still got a pretty long lifetime. So you, you, know, you, you take that on the chin, if you like, the fact that you've got to ra be rather unsympathetic mechanically to, 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 these, to these engines. Yeah, so in terms of technologies, yes, we've got sort of tweaked diesels. Gas is quite, gas engines are especially challenging. I'm not aware of gas engines that can deliver that fast. They're a bit more challenging to, to doctor. Um, there is quite a bit of activity in, in big process industries. You know, if you've got pumps and refrigeration, 
particularly on inverter drives, they can respond very quickly, but again, you need that load there to be able to go up and down, hopefully. So a refrigeration system, you know, um, you know, not far from here, Fife's Bananas have a big ripening plant on the side of the M69, you'd never guess it, but they've got vast amounts of refrigeration that most of the time is tickling along at under 30% output. They have got the ability to ramp up and effect effectively overcool or pull the temperature of the bananas down an extra half a degree or so, or the, the thermal mass to be able to reduce refrigeration use for a period of time and it not affect the process. Um, again, generally struggling to find consistent load that's big enough and consistent enough and able to react like that within protected horticulture. So, yeah. Key thing here is you are paid for availability only. So you are paid so much per megawatt, per hour of availability. However much you are asked to run, you just have to take that on the chin, if you like. You do get the electric to sell, if you, if you, if you are a generator. And yeah, round numbers, maybe worth £20,000 a megawatt. So there's a few tens of thousands of pounds I've been throwing around. Right. Dynamic frequency response. This is really where batteries start to come into play. Similar kind of concept to firm frequency response, but these are like this constant give and take from the grid. I think John mentioned he was stood next to this Tesla thing and over half an hour it ran, I can't remember how many. Yeah, so the forever just on, off, up, down, you know, almost virtually constantly. Key thing here is if you've got a contract for dynamic frequency response, you've got to be able to deliver your full power or take your full power within two seconds. And that's where batteries come into play. Yes, talked about you know, your pumps and compressors again. They've got some potential there, but I'm not seeing the opportunities in protected horticulture. If you think you've got something of that type, do tell me, because I, I haven't found one yet. Um, I, I would love to talk to you. There's something called DROPS, Diesel Rotor UPS. Um, you wouldn't buy one just for this job. They happen to be, they've tended to be using data centers. So they're there already bought and paid for, and this is just something, an extra bit of income you, you can win from them. So it's, it's not something that I would expect you to, to, to be complicating. And of course, batteries. Now, what's this worth? That's where the money is. Forget £5,000 a year, buying electricity cheap and selling it expensive. This is where the money is for batteries. And that's why some battery people are getting a bit excited. So, we start talking about income stacking. You can have capacity, and capacity market and triad income, both of them, with everything else or any combination thereof. Great, put that one in the bank. Store where you cannot play participate in store as well as a frequency response product. Because the car, they're, not, they're kind of delivering the same thing. If you're running for store, and they then actually want you for frequency response as well, you're already running. You cannot deliver the two simultaneously, and it is possible for that, for that to happen. So it's one or the other. And your two frequency response services, again, it's one or the other. But if you've got a battery, why on earth would you do that? firm frequency response at 20 grand a meg when you can get 80 grand on dynamic. So, so yes, that's what we talk when we talk about stacking. Um, just run a few fast round numbers around now. So batteries. John made this point, I'll make it again. It is not about buying cheap, selling expensive. It can be a part of it, but really, that's not where the money is. Oh, that came a bit fast. Um, if we look at a one megawatt installation, just to give us a feeling for that, so we might get our capacity market, I said it was 20 grand. We can stack all of these up. Could be looking at close to 150,000 pound a year of income. Might cost you a million quid, though, for a one megawatt battery, but still, Touching 15%, John said 10 to 12. I, I, I'm, I'm taking a slightly more optimistic view. Um, you know, that's 15%. Mm. But got to remember as well, batteries wear out. By the time you've got your capital back, how much life 
is left in the battery of those things. I mean, probably, what, 10 years, John? Uh, uh, so, you, you know, you haven't got a lot left. You know, the thing's about had it after 10 years, or, or it's really becoming downrated. And as much as it has pained a lot of us in the industry, triads are going. Over the next three years, triads will reduce to virtually zero. Um, so take 45,000 off that. Okay, we've still got 100,000, 10% return. Fr the frequency response market itself is somewhat immature, volatile. A recent auction just completed. Trice prices were notably lower than they have been. It reminds me of what happened to sto store. We used to have av availability prices of about eight to 10 pounds per megawatt per hour. Now it's between three and five. So it becomes a bit more of a brave person's investment does this. Diesel generators, well, oh, come back. Kind of looks a bit interesting, 200 grand for a meg get a megawatt in with a few extra bits and pieces around the side versus an 85,000 pound return. Well, oh, actually that looks all right. But yes, triads are going, these bits and pieces are going. And also, I, I didn't actually realize it at the time, but Thomas the Tank Engine really was very intelligent. Diesel is evil. We all know it, it's in the press. And diesel farms, heavily polluted, millions from subsidies. You know, it, it's, it's a classic headline from The Guardian as it happens, because they're not actually subsidies. You know, it's all these things we're talking about. It's not like the feeding tariff, the RHI, or anything like that. This is all driven by, it's about the cost to run the network. Not subsidies at all. Um, but yes, so diesel is now evil. And actually, if we're going to have a diesel that's compliant, looking forward from January 19, it's going to have to have, to have a catalyst on it. And it could easily double the cost of a project. So you might say, well, why, why are we seeing all these diesel farms going up and all these batteries and things? Well, they're probably projects that are committed. If they got committed and they got installed by, by certain deadlines, they don't have to meet some of these emissions targets. Nobody knew that triads were going until, well, 12 months ago. It was about tw just over 12 months ago when the consultation started. And so probably they've caught a cold. Um, and that's just life, I guess. Grid connections. John mentioned the grid connection thing. Yes, it's... You know, having an export capacity is important. It's a lottery. You know, I think our I think our worst or most memorable one was 26 million for two megawatts. Funnily enough, that project never happened. But you can happen to be in an appropriate place. Upgrades are happening. It is worth asking the question of your local network every now and then, every year or two, or when you see lots of vans running around for long periods of time, just to see if the situation's changed. John mentions behind the meter, and it's where some of the battery guys are heading now. Oh, we can put a 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt behind the meter. That means we're not exporting anything. We're helping you to avoid paying triad costs as an importer, because they're still there. So it's a way of capturing the triad value by avoiding a cost rather than earning income from the grid. Now, this isn't anything at all to do with batteries, but kind of interesting with the way electricity prices are going. 100 kilowatt natural gas CHP, quite a few of you will have gas. Use all that electrics yourself on site. It is now increasingly possible to get a connection agreement that allows you to put generation on and export nothing. And you'll think, well, I can, I can generate electricity for about 5p on gas, offsetting at 10, maybe a bit optimistic there, but you look at the numbers, ah. Little gas engine for your for your own use on site. If you can't, if you if you haven't got the connection or what have you to do a big one, could be interesting. Um, I know it's horrible and evil, nasty fossil fuel, but it is natural gas after all, isn't it? Um, and so yes, the networks are becoming more open-minded at last. Still harder work, but but just create more opportunities. I think I'm running out of time. John's chuckling away there, going, Tim, you can rattle on forever. Um, moving a little bit further down what you might call the food chain, you might think about buying, uh, buying your electricity in what we call a flexible, on what we call a flexible contract for half hourly meter supplies only, which is probably what a lot of you are now, even though you might not have realized it with some recent changes. 
Fixed price contracts can be comfortable, you know exactly what the costs are going to be, but they can hide lots as well of things that you might be able to avoid. And basically, a flexible contract that is kind of taken to its ultimate, you pay a different price for electricity every single half hour. And you end up getting a bill that looks a bit like that, which uh, might scare you silly. And it is continued on the next page, it, and it says more lines than that, which we drill through to something. That shows you what the cost of electricity can look like as it varies through the day. So if you can do stuff to avoid this and focus on using electricity here or whatever, that there is potential to make savings. So, grid services, that's kind of the big sexy where batteries are at and, and all that kind of thing, but all sorts of opportunities, I would say none of it is easy or obvious. Quite a bit of uncertainty around it, but I think maybe we've all become a bit tainted by the comfort and stability of the feed-in tariff and the RHI, and yes, guaranteed for the next 20 years. That's not really the true sort of cut and thrust of market forces, is it? Grid services are very much in, in, in that arena. So maybe we've just got to recalibrate our sensitivity there. Maybe generating your own, even just a little bit to, for your own use. There's an interesting set of numbers there. If you've got a reasonable amount of steady on-site use, 24 hours a day, then maybe a bit of an opportunity. Um, and maybe just to buy electricity flexibly and, and avoid what you can helps you do a little bit. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um. <laughs>